It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast on our new home at Fightful.com. Make sure you check us out over there. That guy is the rock legend. Uh, oh, come on. Come on. The most dangerous podcaster in the world. That's Lars Fredrickson. Well, I feel like when you use that word legend, it's you're getting close to saying you're not relevant anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you know what? You sit know, here with me. Let me just yeah, fair enough. But you know who used to hate that word legend was was Lemmy. Lemmy used to say, "Don't call me a legend. Call me a legend. <laughs> <laughs> call me a legend." Hey. Listen, we have a super special guest. I, I've been giddy all day long because I want to inundate this guy with so many questions. UFC Hall of Famer. It, he's the only guy that could bring the rock to Impact Wrestling. How about that? He's a Hall of Famer in Impact. This is Ken Shamrock. Ken, thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. Hey, listen again. I appreciate you guys having me on, man. Wow. Uh, so listen, I'm going to get my one fanboy question out of the way right here, right now. The match with Bret Hart, Stone Cold Steve Austin, you were the ref. Uh, you know, we all know it with, I think, 10 days from the time you started talking to Vince to the time you signed with the WWE. Uh, Bret was one of the guys who trained you. Uh, this is a two part question, and then I will move on to real journalistic stuff. But one, when you guys were getting ready for this match, did you realize the impact and the change that this match was going to have on the industry too? And this is the big one. Uh, we know Brett trained you, but to be a ref, you you have to know the spots, where to stand. You're, you're new in the WWE. Who kind of taught you how to be a ref when, when you were going through this monumental match? Yeah, well, first one is, uh, yeah, it's... Uh... No, we didn't really understand the level of what was going to happen in that uh, ring before. It was one of those matches where they were trying to turn Stone Cold and Brett, uh, their characters, they were, they were switching roles. They thought it would be a great match, but I don't think anybody truly understood the impact that match would have moving forward because I think if you look at it, I think that really kind of changed the tide of the, the wars between, you know, um, WWE or F, whatever you want to call it, um, and um, obviously WCW. Uh, I think when you saw that match, you started seeing characters. The Attitude Era, I think, was born then. I really started to take hold of this vision, I think, Vince had by bringing me in, trying to make it a little bit more raw and rough and edgy. Um, and so putting me in that match with those two guys, with the match that they put on was just unbelievable the way that turned things around. Um, and, uh, you know, I had the privilege of being able to go down to Calgary and work with Bret Hart, work with some other guys down there, even met Stu. Uh, and you know, I didn't know the significance of that until later, you know, but when I was there, it just felt like you know, I was at home, like I, I could relate to these guys. Um, and they were all hard workers. They all had goals and they set goals and they would, they would accomplish them by hard work. So I felt really, really at home there. And, and uh, I learned a whole lot in a short amount of time that I was there. And I think by being there, it helped me truly understand the character that I needed to be going into pro wrestling. Like I wasn't a pro wrestler. I was an MMA fighter. I was a mixed martial artist. And I need to make sure that I stay true to that character, that person that I was going into pro wrestling. And Brett helped me do that by making sure that everything I did was along the same lines as who I was as a submission specialist. Well, listen, I've obviously been a fan. I own your book. Okay. Hey, right um, I bought it when it first came out. You also, your last MMA fight was with uh, a friend of mine. Uh, by the name of Brian Johnson, who grew up in my neighborhood, and we were we knew each other since we were kids. Last time I ran into him it was in Japan when we were over in Japan, and he was doing some Japan stuff. And I and I think he had an accident or something like that. I I, don't, I haven't really heard since. But my question to you is is like okay, so you've been doing this MMA, you've been trained to basically kill somebody, right? You know, and then you go into this world of sports entertainment or pro wrestling. 
whatever you feel you want to call it. Was it hard for you to kind of dis disconnect from, you know, maybe softening up the blows, you know, sort of pulling the punches a little bit, or, you know, were you more apt to potato somebody like at the beginning, or were you kind of like, oh, I kind of get this? Well, I think a lot of people forget that I was Vince Torelli um, early on before I started doing MMA or fighting. I was in the uh, North Carolina um, pro wrestling circuit, South Atlantic pro wrestling and North Atlantic pro wrestling. I worked with guys, Chavez and, you know, Steamboat and, uh, and just a lot of different guys that was a lot of talent down there. And early on, I went as Vince Torelli. So I got an understanding of what it was and what I was doing. Obviously, I took a different turn when I went to Japan. I started finding the, more of the hybrid shoot uh, wrestling. And then, of course, the straight shoot um, with Pancras. And then, of course, into the UFC. But, you know, I started out as a pro wrestler. So when I, when I decided that I needed to make a change um, from the MMA world into something well, I didn't know what it was going to be, but I had to be able to pay my bills, be able to keep the guys training and fighting at my dojo, be able to support that. Then I had a group home for kids where I was raising six kids uh, that were at risk kids that were placed in a home. I had that to make sure I upheld Then I had my own house. So I had three homes. Plus, I had three buildings that were my training facilities. And so it was a, quite a bill each month to be able to keep everything up and going that I wanted to do. And I told myself that if I couldn't do what I love doing uh, and support my family and my my world that I live in, then I would have to go do something else. And that's kind of what it came down to was that I had to go do something else. And that's where I got into the pro wrestling. But when I got into pro wrestling, a lot of people didn't know I was Vince Torelli. So I went into pro wrestling and I started, even though it's another level, it, it's, it's uh, I don't care how long you've been wrestling, getting into the WWF. And then performing on that stage is 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 not easy, right? So, and I was out of it for, I don't know, 10 years, 8, 10 years to go back and then start doing it. Um, but because I had an understanding of it, it didn't take me as long to really get back into the groove. Uh, I mean, I had my match with Bader, and that was one that was very aggressive. Uh, but both of us knew that's what we were doing. So it was the way we wanted it. Um, but after that, I had to really understand where I needed to go with other people because guys like Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker and some of these other guys, you know, weren't going to take the kind of things that Vader took. Um, and so I had to learn where that space was. And so by having that match with Vader really gave me an understanding of where I needed to be and how much I need to back out. <sighs> You, you mentioned in past interviews about your friendship with D Malenko back when you used to wrestle uh, before the MMA stuff. When you were elevated to the WWE, did you kind of keep in touch with him throughout the years? Did you, you, did you lean on him for more advice? I didn't. Um, it's funny because I, when I got into the actual fighting and stuff, and that you know, Dean was obviously the one that introduced me to the to the actual UWF. And so I went over there and once I did that, it was almost like my, my world just took off. Like I was just like going, but all along the way, I've always kept in touch. I mean, not like a, a writing or calling or anything like that, but we've always kind of stayed in touch. Even with this brother, Jody, um, I've seen him about a, uh, six months, eight months ago. And then just talked to him the other day um, uh, through social media. Um, so I've stayed in touch, obviously, you know, Dean's not doing well. Um, so it's, it's difficult to stay in touch with him right now, but I do through, through his brother, uh, just do social media stuff. So it's difficult when you're trying to achieve goals and you're, you're starting to take off and some people are going this way and you're going that way. Um, and you're focused on achieving things, right? You, you, you really don't want to take anything away from what your focus is going to be to achieve your goals. So it's difficult, but now that we have all this social media, it's easy to shoot texts out here and there. Well, you know, one, I want to go back to one of the things that you're talking about, because you said that the style that you worked with Vader obviously wasn't going to work, work with Sean or Taker. So did you have conversations prior to, the, to matches with those guys and, and ask them what they would accept or what not to accept, or did you have to learn the hard way? No, actually, uh, um, I kind of figured it out myself because like I said, I had guys like Brett and other people around me that I could talk with, you know, even uh, uh, Billy Gunn, 
um, Road Dog. I hung out with those guys, Steve Blackman. Um, so it was a lot of guys that I could go talk to. A lot of them were all very willing to help me. Um, a lot of those guys were fans, you know, of, of what I had done prior. So I really did have a great, great um, opportunity to really learn from these guys. And I did. I made sure that I asked questions and that I made sure that, you know, I went up to whoever I was wrestling, whether it be Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, you know, Animal Hawk, whoever it was. I'd go up to them and say, hey, you know, um, you know, what do you got in mind? And so they were all pretty, pretty uh, good about understanding that I had to be me. And so basically whatever they would do something, even though they didn't know what the hold was, I would put them in it. They didn't have to go with me because I could just put them there. Um, so a lot of the stuff I did when I was doing pro wrestling was things that I did. Um, and they never really been in those moves before. So I would just do it like a shoot other right. than breaking something or really trying to tap them out. I would just get there, put them in the hold, uh, and then let them work and sell from there. So it was easier for me just to go in and do it rather than try to explain to them what I wanted them to do. I just put them there myself. Got it. In the history of my fandom, you were one of the first MMA guys that I saw make the crossover into pro wrestling. I'm sure there might have been one or two before you. I, I don't know the history. Do you, being that guy that crossed over and now being being able to watch with the eye from MMA and an eye for wrestling, look at these young guys who are making the crossover from MMA to wrestling and, and critique them a little bit different. Yeah. You know, the, the, the biggest pitfall um, that I see a lot of, a lot of them doing um, is that they end up becoming pro wrestlers. Um, they came from the MMA world and then you just start seeing them do hip tosses and, and all these things instead of trying to be more creative with the submissions, uh, with things mm. that they did in the MMA world, even with kicks, punches, knees, elbows, even throws, suplexes. Um, but, you know, you, you just start to see them start to blend in with pro wrestling. And uh, there's a few of them in there now that when you look at it, you don't see the MMA in them. You know, you see spots here and there, but it's not constant. It's, it's starting to flow like pro wrestling again. And I think that that's where a lot of them make a mistake is, is that they don't stay true to who they are because they want to, I don't know, I guess be able to work with everyone and be able to do whatever they're doing. And it's just not unique. Right. And, and the way you stay in this business a long time and be able to keep your character alive is by being true to that character and not blending in as a wrestler. And I see that happening a lot with these guys that are crossing over. They get there, it's great for a minute, but then they start doing hip tosses and all these pro wrestling things and the selling and all that other stuff. And it's like, pretty soon it's just going to be, you're just going to be another wrestler. Well, let me ask you this. How about the, the, you know, the role is reversed. We've seen some pro wrestlers try their hands at MMA. What are your thoughts behind that? Yeah, I think it's awesome. Um, you know, you see it all the time in, in uh, WWF. And in fact, I think it gets a pretty good pop when you see a pro wrestler really throw an ankle lock up somebody or, or you, you know, you see an arm bar or, or a rear naked choke. I mean, it gets a good pop because now you're starting to see these wrestlers expanding their minds into other things, just like guys that are in MMA are expanding their minds into pro wrestling. But you have to make sure that whatever you do in your character that you stay true to who you are and don't just blend in and be another wrestler or for a pro wrestler to blend in and be an MMA guy because he doesn't have the credentials for that. Yes, it's cool to see him do it. It's cool to see him blend it in, but they shouldn't change from being who they are either. Well, uh, second part of that question, I guess, would be what about actually pro wrestlers going into the world of MMA fighting in the UFC? We've seen that. We've seen you know, big name professional wrestlers make that, that change. What, what are your thoughts behind that? Yeah, it's tough. Um, it, it's a tough go. Um, because I think that I was the first one, really the first one, um, to go from pro wrestling into fighting and I was very successful at it. Um, but I don't, don't know if anyone else has really been able to do that as a pro wrestler, because I mean, a lot of people don't, don't, understand it. I was a pro wrestler. <laughs> That's what I did for a living. Um, and then I went into the MMA where I went to Pancras 
um, you know, UWF, Pancreas, and then UFC, and then back into the WWF. But I wasn't strictly a pro wrestler. And so it's hard for people to go, well, uh, he was an MMA guy that went into pro wrestling. Uh, no, I was a pro wrestler who went into mixed martial arts. And so I haven't seen too many people be successful at um, going from pro wrestling into MMA, but I've seen a lot of guys and girls go from the UFC into pro wrestling and do well. This might be one of those questions designed to get uh, wrestling headlines, but I have to ask this. You are a, a two-time Hall of Famer, but the glaring omission right now is the WWE. Do you feel like, A, you, you deserve to be a WWE Hall of Fame, or maybe it's a slight that you haven't been asked? Because as a fan, me, this is me saying that I feel like you've been slighted. You deserve that honor for what you did, your part in changing the industry and creative in WWE. Yeah, no question. I mean, you look at it and, um, you know, you, did you, as a as an athlete or as whoever you may be uh, going into whatever Hall of Fame, did you did you make a significant um, change? Did you make it better? Um, and if you look at it, you would absolutely say yes because you see all these submissions. I brought them there. I made it successful. I I I I made the path from being a big time MMA guy into pro wrestling and made it known to everyone that you could do this and broke the mold. And so um, it's, it's not a slight uh, by any means. I don't look at it like that. I just look at it as that whatever the things going on behind the scenes are, that is irrelevant to me. Um, you know, there was no tap out uh, before Ken Shamrock, you know, there was obviously I give up matches, verbal things, things of that nature, but not necessarily a tap out. Like you had to tap out in order for them to stop it. So there's a lot of things I did that I thought that, you know, warranted being able to have an opportunity to be able to be in the Hall of Fame. But I can't control those things. Like, I mean, I've been inducted into Impact. I've been inducted into San Diego Hall of Fame. I've inducted the UFC Hall of Fame. You know, there's a lot of things that I, I'm very grateful that I've, I've gotten the opportunity to be involved with and be inducted into. Um, so stuff like that, it's like, yeah, I think I deserve to be in, but it's not my call. Did you ever regret when you first started getting into the MMA, you go over to Japan with these uh, these shoot promotions or half shoot promotions. Did you ever regret leaving the world of professional wrestling behind once you got your MMA career starting to go? No, uh I think life goes in transitions, right? You're, if it, I wasn't, I wasn't settled with just doing pro wrestling. I wanted to be more challenged. You know, I did tough bands while I was doing pro wrestling because I wanted combat. And, uh, and I, and I played football, you know, college, high school. I, I, I love challenges, physical challenges. Wrestling was obviously a challenge, but it wasn't at the level that I wanted to be at that age. You know, I was 29, 30 years old and I was hungry. I wanted to be challenged more. And so that's whenever I got the opportunities, even in the, the UWF and then in the uh, Fujiwara Gumi uh, uh, promotions, they were always basically, I was the aggressor and they were always trying to keep me toned down a little bit because I always wanted to keep going hard. And I kept telling them to hit me, don't pull back. I won't sell it if you don't put it on that kind of stuff, because I wanted to challenge myself and be more aggressive, but I didn't believe that we could be any more aggressive, right? Until Pankers came out. Uh, and then when that came out, they told me that this is going to be legit. I was like, I'm in because it, I was hungry. I wanted to know who, what I could do physically in a, in that arena, that real fighting with kicking, punching, going to the ground with submissions. I wanted to challenge myself to see whether or not I could be great. And so when that happened, I jumped into it. Obviously, first Pancras event, I won it uh, against Fanaki. And then, of course, on to win the, the first belt um, in a tournament. And then, of course, into the UFC and winning that at first super fight. Um, so it was. It, it was kind of just a transition into where I was at in my life where I wanted to be challenged. Well, then I got to a point 
where I couldn't make the money I needed to at the time. And so I needed to do something else. And so I went into it um, more or less to be able to keep the things I built up and going. But once I got into it, because of the level uh, of the WWF and as competitive as it was, as far as challenging yourself, being able to do all the things you need to do to be successful in that arena, I got swallowed up into it and, and very, really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, it, 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 unfortunately, there was just things that happened in the WWF that side, side kind of sidetracked me from really focusing on doing more in the WWF, you know, when it came to that screw job with Bret Hart, it just felt like, wow, uh, everything that I believed in or everything that felt like I bought into was rattled. This is a two-part question because when you transition from WWF back to UFC, you've talked a little bit in the past about how they didn't really believe in you. They didn't think you were going to bring the buys or the numbers. And you were on a very uh, unceremoniously losing streak in the WWE at that time. Do you feel like, A, that might have hurt your reputation? And B, when you make the leap, you bring the numbers, you bring the pay-per-view, you triple their buy rates when you come in. Did that did that help because of the WWE's fan base following you over? Yeah, you know, um, it was uncomfortable because of everything going on. I don't know if it's so much about the losing. I think it was more about everything that happened um, during that time with different storylines that I was, they were, they were going to put me in and it just felt like I was just in the, in the weeds. And, you know, they had this focus on these other guys, which rightfully so, cause they were huge stars, but it just felt like I wasn't everything that I had built, the reputation, the championships coming from this real world, helping build the attitude era. I was just being held in this washing machine and just being spun around with no direction. And so at, at some point, uh, some other things that happened in there, uh, you know, with, with what happened with Brett and Owen and a lot, just a lot of things. And it just, it just didn't feel like I belonged there. Like, like something just didn't feel right for me being there. And so then I ended up getting my release, but when I came back, there was no doubt in my mind. And I just, where it's kind of, sad that there's really no mention or no one really talks about it but if you want to look at the ufc and where it was at at the time i came back it was dead it was dying you mm -hmm. tito was their champion nothing against mm -hmm. tito tito was a tremendous star but he had no character nobody to fight that would help him build numbers he, and he was beating guys and he was getting 20 to thirty thousand buys but he had nobody to really challenge him in that character aspect to really get people to want to watch these fights because it's not just about fighting. It's also about characters and villains and good guys and all these storylines that you build into fighting. Tito didn't have that. Um, but when I came over, I knew the shadow of a doubt that I would be able to build those numbers because I did it before I left and I had the character. And when I went into pro wrestling, the reason why I was successful in pro wrestling was because I had character. Because I could get people to want to watch my matches. Not just with in-ring stuff, but it was also just character-wise. Not necessarily Mike, but just character. The way I carried myself, the way I looked at people, the way I did with my matches, the anger, the frustration, the selling. All the things I did within that squared circle got people to want to watch me wrestle. And I did it in the MMA before that. So going back into the UFC, I told Dana White, I said, I could knock these up over 100,000. They didn't believe me. The fact is, I bet on myself. Told him, you give me this much, and I want this much if I break 100,000 buys. Of course, I went over 150,000 buys, which was crazy. And then after that, we were up over 900,000 buys. And then the third one, I think, we're like whatever it was, we had the, the largest amount of viewership on it because I believe it was on TV or something. or another. I don't remember what it was, but the viewership was just tremendous. So it was literally uh, when I got there, they were dying. After I left, they were a $4 billion company. Well, the first time I ever saw the UFC, I mean, I'm going to incriminate myself here a little bit, but I had a roommate at the time, and he had one of those illegal cable boxes, right? So you get all the free pay-per-views, you know? We, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> you know, the neighborhood. You, just, you, you can take yeah. the boy out of the neighborhood, not the neighborhood out of the boy. 
and I and I caught the very first UFC. Did you see coming from Japan into that? Because I mean, you had so many shoot promotions, or there was a lot of those in Japan. It seemed like there there was Shudo. There were so many other ones, smaller ones that I was a fan of and watching. And, it, and I, maybe they coincided at the same time with the UFC. But um, did you see what the trajectory where the UFC was going to go? Because by the fourth one, people started to kind of notice. It wasn't a very well-known kind of thing, but just to have the sumo wrestler versus the boxer and these types of you know uh, matches put together, I think it drew a lot of interest. But did you see that it was going to be, you know, what it was, what it, what, what it became in those early stages. I, mean, I don't think too many people saw it, that it was even going to be around because I think most of us thought we were going to be shut down because it was constant yeah. battles. It seemed to get worse and worse every time. Boxing, the Boxing Commission were really the commission. Um, were really pushing to get us out because it was growing fast. Um, so just a lot of us were just, you know, weren't really thinking about what was going to happen in the future, but what we were in and doing at that moment. Um, and that's kind of how I proceeded throughout my career was like just focusing on the here and now uh, and whatever happens in, in the future, I have no control over, but I will control what I'm what I'm doing now. And so that's kind of how, how I handled my career was I just controlled the things I could control at the moment. And that was going in and winning. And so that's what I did. We're talking like your career is over. You were just, you know, recently on Impact. You were the only guy to defeat Father Time at this point. And it's impressive how phenomenal you you still look. You're in the ring. You're out working guys that are half your age. Are, are, do, do you still feel like you, even after this last Impact run, you might still have something left in the tank if, if you want to? Well, uh you know, if, if it's something I wanted to do, there's no doubt in my mind what I can do. I, I, I just, I, my mental state of mind is just, I believe is stronger than, than anyone. Um, and I believe that. I believe that I can put myself in positions to be able to win against anybody, no matter what age I'm at. Um, and But it's just me. That's how I've been my whole life. I always believed in myself. I believe that I can control whatever destiny that's gonna is that's moving forward and that i will be in control of that nobody else uh and and i have and that leads me into pretty much what i'm doing now you know you need people talk about me wanting to you know get back in wrestling or, or do some fights and it's like i've kind of already pushed put my mind aside from that competing and really focus more on about being able to to make it better be able to give fighters or or sports entertainers opportunities to do something different and uh you know i so i went into actually building my own league which is valor bare knuckle um it was something that i fell in love with early on in my career uh with the bare knuckle fighting uh no rules everything goes it just felt like it was god-given talent purity you didn't have anything to make anybody better whether you wore a gi that made you better it's like or put a glove on somebody that makes you better. It gives people opportunities to be better. And that's why I never understood when you're talking about this kind of fighting is why you would give somebody something that's going to make them better, like a glove or taping their hands or, you know, uh, putting a gi on. It just, it's supposed to be a combative sport where it's you basically using your own God given talent to compete against another person. And so, I told myself I'd ever the opportunity to be able to go back and try to rerun this thing and bring back that purity of fighting, I would do it. And so that's what really brought me up to Valor Sports um, or ValorBK.com. Valor Sports is our business company, but Valor BK is the uh, fight league. Um, and so I told myself I was going to go back to the pure fighting where it would give guys to, an opportunity to come in and really just show their talents uh, and really make it aggressive tough like mono mono and so um bringing in valor bare knuckle we did our first show and it was tremendous and i mean it was true bare knuckle everybody else says hey it's bare knuckle but they're wrapping their hands it's like that's not bare knuckle so but they call it bare knuckle and it's like it's not bare knuckle and so valor is really the true first true real bare knuckle organization and not just because i want to do bare knuckle but it's safer and a lot of people are like, well, what are you talking about? Say it's safer because you put a glove on somebody, and I know because I fought. You wrap your hands, put a four-ounce glove on somebody, and now you're saying I can hit you a hundred times in your head 
without damaging my knuckles. You take that glove off and the tape off, and I try to fight the same way, I break my hand. So the reality of what they were doing early on in the UFC when they were putting gloves on guys and saying that they were trying to make it safer, not true. They were making it safer and protecting the hand because guys were breaking their hands, trying to get into the finals, and they'd be damaged. The guy couldn't fight. So they brought in those gloves to try to protect the hand, not the head of the fighter, the hand. And so I brought that back and said, you know what? It's going to be pure bare knuckle. Um, and then no clinching because it slows down fights. Boxing, the most boring thing is a clinch. So took out the, the clinching. We wanted straight up fighting. Um, obviously, no cages, no ropes. If you've seen it before, it's, it's uh, such a visual explosion to be able to sit and watch fights with nothing in your way. And a lot of people, even myself, when I first did it, going, I wonder if this would be it's going to be hard for people to stay in. But in my mind, I was like, I've never needed ropes. I've never needed cages to keep me in there fighting. And if you truly are there to fight, then you don't need the cage. You don't need the ropes. And it would be a lot faster pace of a fight because now you don't have anything to back up into. So now you have to use your footwork and fight. So we did it that way. And it just, it, to me, it came off big. I mean, everybody loved it. It, it was something huge. Of course, COVID hit. Um, so we had to revamp and think it a little bit, built into social media stuff where we are right now. Um, speaking of social media, if you guys want to follow me, you can go to my Instagram, which is Ken Shamrock Official, or you can go to the Valor one, which has all of our updated news, which uh, will be our launch party coming up January 7th. If you want to check that out, you can go to our app, which is called Valor. Um, you can go check that out on Instagram, Valor. And that has all of our updated news for our January 7th, which is going to be our watch party. And we will be announcing our next fights coming up um, off of uh, the January 7th watch party. We will announce all our upcoming events. So, yeah, like I said, there's a lot going on. Uh, it's been uh, an awesome journey with this because my love has always been fighting and being competitive. But at the same time, my love has always been able to give other people opportunities to follow their dreams, too, with what I experienced with that first no holds barred bare knuckle mixed martial arts. To me, it was unbelievable. And so I just want to bring it back so other people get that same experience that I had. Yeah, I got to follow up real quick. Can you are now a promoter you've worked for two probably of the greatest promoters vince mcmahon and dana white what have you learned from them that you're applying with balor yeah i think it's just about having a vision and then make putting the pieces together um and i think the biggest thing uh which leads to me to my uh next uh shout out um is surrounding yourself with successful people winners People that you know that are going to be there and know what they're doing and going to put you, put your business in the best place to succeed. And speaking of that, I had a couple guys that fought with me uh, that were on the Lions, actually under Jerry Bolander, uh, the Lions in Napa. Those guys were actually training under Jerry. And then one of them was Matty Miranda, who um, is the guy that's actually helped me build the business around this. Once he saw it, he was like, dude, it's lightning in a bottle. So he's really structuring the business to really put this out there so that people can see it. Um, obviously, the vision was mine, but he put that business structure around it. Then um, Todd Middendorf, uh, who's been, uh, you know, obviously fighting uh, as long as I have a long time. And now he's uh, he's promoted a lot of fights along with Matty, promoted a lot of fights together. Um, so when on fight night, he's the guy that makes that wheel turn on fight night. So Todd Middendorf's a really strategic uh, partner for us to be able to get those fights to be able to run smoothly that night. Um, and Steve uh, uh, Gritzy, who is uh, our tech guy who does a lot of stuff with tech. Um, he's been doing a great job uh, putting this pieces together so that people are able to understand what it is that we're doing and be able to go on these social media platforms and find out everything that we're doing. Um, Andy, who is another guy, friend of, of Steve's who is really a genius at marketing. Um, and you're going to see that when we start marketing our January 7th watch party, you'll see uh, the way that that happens. And it's just been tremendous to see some of the work that he's done. Uh, Ted um, K, who works in the music business, has been a music producer, manages a lot of musicians. He manages me, obviously has a lot of connections that's been helping us through Valor uh, with his, his network. 
Um, and then Alex Nace, Alex Wuhan, both those guys are in the NFT and the crypto world. They have great connections there. We're looking forward to doing stuff in the metaverse. So there's a lot of stuff going on. We're not just staying in that, in that niche that uh, everybody's used to seeing. We're going outside the lines. We're building things so that people are able to come and actually view this in all kinds of different ways. Uh, Nick, who's our production guy, he's got his own production. He's out of Florida. Um, he's putting all the pieces together when it comes to actually getting it out to everybody, streaming it to people. So again, and there's many more I could go on, but I don't want to take up too much time. We got a strong network. And that's something, like you said, when you talk about uh, Vince and data, one thing I learned is, is that it wasn't those guys um, that were doing all the work. They had a lot of good people around them that were able to put them in position to be able to put their vision where they wanted it to go. <laughs> You know, bare knuckle boxing is probably one of the most exciting things. Honestly, I've, I've had the pleasure, albeit it was a, a decade or two ago, to see a few of these live. It was in England and uh, at a pretty, pretty rad place for it to go down. And it's, it's definitely one of those exciting things. Did you, um, but I want to uh, digress a little bit and go back to the WWE because on your way out, you know, you said that you kind of had lost that passion. You know, the thing with Brett happened, the thing with Owen happened, all these things. Uh, were you ever really bitter at that experience um, coming coming out of it? Were you, um, let's say, did you feel disenfranchised in any way? Yeah, I don't, it's, uh, boy, you know, I wasn't, obviously, I didn't do everything right either. There was a lot of things I did that probably caused them not to want to keep pushing me in the direction that I was, that I, I thought I was going. Um, but I just, like I said, I, I, it was one of those things where it just felt like I just didn't belong. And I, I don't know if it was anything that they particularly did on purpose. Uh, I just think it maybe was just one of those things where you start growing and you start feeling like, wait, maybe this isn't the direction I need to be going. Uh, I always had a love for MMA. Uh, I felt like maybe there was some unfinished business. Um, and I think it was probably a good thing I did because who knows where the UFC would be if I had to come back and had the rivalry with Tito. Who knows? Uh, does it still stay? Somebody buy it? Does it still stay alive? Because they were dead. They were dying. And, um, you know, no matter what anybody says or, or how they want to put it, um, the facts are the facts. And, you know, the reality show that they put together, which was the ultimate fighter, you know, that idea, you got to, it's got to come from the lion's den, because if you look at it, that's what I did. I had housed fighters. I had did tryouts. I had filmed these guys doing tryouts. And so it's funny how there's so much of that DNA uh, of, of the lion's den that was, was filtered into the UFC, including myself to help them get over the hump, be able to turn it into a full billion dollar company. I know we'll be wrapping this up. I got a couple more questions. I know Lars has a couple more questions. Uh, you make the jump back to impact is, was it like riding the bike? You, you never forget. Did you get in there and did you still have, uh, I don't want to say flashbacks or, or thoughts of how you left the WWE, but when you come back into the wrestling uh, business with Impact, was it a clean slate? How'd that go down? Yeah, I just went back in. I had guys that contacted me, interested to see if I want to do wrestling. And I said, yes, yeah. so I did a few spots. And then, you know, once I did a few spots that, you know, obviously to myself, I, I just felt like it was natural. I went right back into it. They They thought it was natural. The crowd loved it. So it just kind of flowed right back into it. It wasn't really a hard effort for me to just go right back in and start working as the Ken Shamrock. Um, you know, obviously I, I still had a following. So um, there's a lot of people that followed me from pro wrestling into the world of uh, mixed martial arts and then back out again and then back again. So it just, I just felt like I had a great fan base that really helped me go and do the things I needed to do, whether it was in MMA or pro wrestling, I had a great following. You know, when you come into a company and you have, you know, you had a pretty legit reputation. I mean, let, no one can ever argue that. Did, was there ever a moment where you feel where you felt like with the pro wrestling that you were being tested in some way? Not sure what you mean. 
Well, what I mean is, is like you have this reputation for being a badass, legit shoot fighter. Okay. You walk in the world of pro wrestling and there's obviously a lot of egos there. So I'll just get straight to the fucking point. I don't know why I tried to sugarcoat it. But anyways, did anybody ever try to test you? No, I think they were more interested in, uh, you know, the things I knew. I mean, obviously I got to roll with black men. I got to roll with some other guys and, and I mean, anybody uh, that ever rolled with me or ever was with me would, would tell you that, you know, I was legit. There's no question um, when in that pro wrestling that there was nobody there that could hold a candle to me when it came to actual shooting. Um, anybody that says anything different, that's that pro wrestling character coming out of them because, um, <laughs> you know, I don't think there's any, any doubt in anybody's mind. Uh, obviously, with me being a world champion in Japan and being a world champion in the United States at the same time, I was the world's most dangerous man and nobody could beat me. And so going into pro wrestling, I <laughs> I don't I don't think that somebody that did a career in pro wrestling would have a chance of it actually beating me at my game. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I know, but you, I, I mean, the reason why I asked the question is because, you know, I feel like a, even a friend of mine, his name's Eric, he was like six time Muay Thai uh, kickboxing champion. And people like to test him for whatever fucking reason. It's like, you know what this guy is, you know what this guy does, it's in his fucking DNA. But I'm just thinking, like, with all the massive egos there, with all of that there, you know, I mean, I would obviously wouldn't never d done that to you, but you never know. There could be some, you know, dude out there, you know, in there that nobody, world. Nobody did that because I think when you're at that level in the WWF, yeah. it's business and everybody right. knows it's business. And so right. you didn't have that. And I guess maybe on a smaller circuit or if you're going around there, somebody wants to kind of, you know, get the best of you uh, and get over on you in a, in a, in a match where they try to make you look stupid. Um, yeah, maybe in lower circuits, but at the WWF, man, that, that I, everybody was professional. It was about getting the match over, putting on great matches and everybody walking out of there healthy. Uh, for my last question tonight, before we start promoting everything again, uh, the, the, the rock introducing you in inducting you into the impact hall of fame that, that could not have been in these as easy as picking up a phone and going, Hey, can you do this for me? What What's the story behind how that happens? I'm sure you've talked about it before. I haven't seen it, but inquiring minds want to know. Yeah, it, it's very difficult when you're both kind of growing and you're, I literally went in a different direction. He went in a different direction and we're both off trying to create great opportunities for our families so that they never have to work again. And so we're out there trying to build our businesses and Rock is doing his thing, and Rock has reached this level that hardly anybody can get to this guy, right? Even me, right? So I shoot out this text through social media, even though we talk on social media, we shoot it out here and there, <clears throat> but I couldn't get a hold of him. So I just shot this text out, hey, man, be great, Rock, if you can introduce, and, you know, I'm going into the Hall of Fame, if you could reach out and do the introduction. He reached right back out to me, because I know if I tried to go straight through, it would go through so many people before it got to him. And it would get shot down. But if I knew if he knew it was me, he would respond to it right away. Um, so that's how it happened. And I was so, so blessed that, um, you know, he did it right away. And what he said was was truly uh, a blessing. Uh, we really did, when we did our matches, we truly did uh, put each other in great positions to be successful and to be able to move on where we're at right now. And I'm very, very, very happy for him. And I know he's happy for me uh, on our successes. You know, you see, are you a current uh, pro wrestling fan? I mean, do you watch the, the current product that's going out there now these days? I, I keep up with highlights. Um, I don't really get to watch any of the fights or any of the wrestling events. I don't get to watch much of anything really because I'm either I'm traveling or I'm spending time with my family. So, um, yeah, it's tough, but I do stay up on everything because I have to, because I even got a podcast where I break down NFL because I'm a huge NFL fan. So I break down games and things of that nature. So I'm in a lot of things. Um, and so I enjoy being able to live life uh, to the fullest. And that's what I'm doing. So it's like I said, it's, it's a fun run right now and I'm enjoying it again. Um, I just can't wait to see what, what's going to be 
happening next with this Valor because I truly believe that this is the next big event. So what, what, being a, well, pause, just I'm sorry, real quick because he just talked about NFL. I mean, and since I'm you know born and raised a Raiders fan, what do you got for me, Ken? Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> it's a good thing the Raiders don't have a uh, or, or need a uh, receiver or running back or quarterback. They need defensive backs and offensive linemen. And so just just because they ain't got a very, very high pick in the first round, ain't going to hurt them. They need to get these picks going in the second, third and fourth rounds and get some offensive linemen and some cornerbacks, cornerbacks to be able to, to, to kind of seal up that back end of the defense and be able to get that offensive line fixed. Because, you know, you look at the Rams or same thing where they they came out, they had everything but an offensive line. Yeah. What's what's the name of the of the football podcast? Uh, I'm not sure because it's a friend of mine, uh, uh, Alex uh, Houlihan, who is on his Instagram, and I go on his Instagram, and we actually break down NFL games on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, 10, 11, 12, 1, 1 o'clock. Every uh, 1 o'clock on those days on the Instagram, it's Alex Houlihan. Do you, do you play fantasy football? I do. I got three leagues. I got two redraft leagues, and I got one dynasty league. Oh, see, I've been trying to get Lars to play with me. He just won't ju- make the jump. Oh, I got two kids. Uh, well, you know what? I got two kids. I'm like you, Ken. It's like I'm just trying to keep the family fed, and you know, <laughs> I, I feel I feel like as you get older and you do the stuff, you know, in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, then it becomes then family be- starts taking more of a priority, and it started that with that with me in my early 40s, just by I think it's just nat- natural, just nature. So now. The extra time I get to come and chat with guys like you, though, which I'm, you know, very blessed that, you know, we're super stoked to have you on this show, you know, watching you and being a fan of both of your careers, seeing you, you know, do your thing live and, you know, in, in different states of the union. It's, it's it's been pretty awesome. And now to be talking to you now, it's it's pretty, pretty freaking cool. So but, you know, your new thing, Valor, it's a bare knuckle, bare knuckle boxing. It's legit. How far are you away from original rules? Are you pretty close to original rules? Yeah, unlike some of the other ones, uh, we want to keep it traditional. All we want to do is take the gloves off and the and the tape off and have a true bare knuckle. So, mm-hmm. but what we've done um, is we cut the rounds down to three rounds, um, and there's no clinching. You can't clinch. Your hands okay, have okay, to stay okay. closed, and you have to fight. You can bounce inside. You can yeah. shoulder bump. You can't grab anything. You have to fight out of the out of the uh, inside. No clinching. So it just makes it faster that way. But we're excited about where it's going. And um, January seventh, we're doing a launch party, and it'll be on our app. And that app is called Valor. Make okay, sure one final. Have, yeah. So I got one final question. Uh, are you going to be taking this? You know, are you going to be trying to tour this type of stuff? Because I know different states have different rules and different laws, just like. You know, a lot of things get, you know, like the UFC, I know, had problems early on because of the MMA stuff. Is it a different world out there for, for things like this? It is. I think that because we're seeing a lot of this stuff like slap boxing and yeah. stuff that's just nuts. Um, bare knuckle isn't isn't uh, going to be that hard. We've gone to places and we're doing fights and it's easy to get it sanctioned. So I think in the world that we're living in today. Um, I think bare knuckle is definitely, in my opinion, uh, longevity uh, is a lot safer rather than uh, putting the gloves on somebody and taping their hands. It just creates too much brain damage. As a, and you're only fighting three rounds instead of 12 rounds. And it just right. it's just so much more brain damage happening when you're putting a glove on somebody. So I believe after we do it for a while, just like with the UFC, where people will start seeing that – it's not as violent as people think it is. There's a lot of blood. There's a lot of cuts, broken bones. But as far as brain damage, it's a lot less. Well, make sure you follow him on Instagram, Kim, Kin Shamrock Official over at Twitter. It's Shamrock Kin. Uh, Wrestling Perspective at uh, WP underscore pod. We're now on Fightful at your Sundays. And then on our regular feed, it's four days later. So if you want to hear it fresh, go to Fightful four days later. You'll still get it. Uh, Go follow us on both. 
you know, Fightful and uh, Wrestling Perspective YouTube pages. Subscribe to them and uh, listen to the back catalog of interviews. Ken Shamrock, we're going to say our goodbyes off the air. But for everybody, the show is over. Thank you so much for being generous with your time with us tonight. Yeah, appreciate you guys. Thank you.